So let's get started here. So it's 2018, and we have more benefits in the workplace than ever before. We have cared food, work from home privileges, and now more beanbags and cubicles. But the thing is, is that, what's the point of it? It's to make the work feel less like work. And yet Gallup Research finds that over 70% of millennials are not engaged in the workplace with all these benefits. So how do you engage people if giving them more things is not the answer? Well, that's something that I'd like to cover you with today. Specifically how to attract millennials, bring them into your company, manage them, retain them, and build that engagement throughout the process. Now, I know a lot of you probably have read things on Forbes or uh, News Weekly about millennials. And the funny thing is that the vast majority of people who talk about millennials are not millennials. <laughs> That's like going to a foreign country and asking everyone about it who hasn't been there what it's like. So, being a millennial, I went to UC Berkeley. I actually studied uh, computer science and we were ranked number two in the nation, second to MIT. And so there's a lot of recruiters trying to figure out you know, how to you know, attract myself and colleagues, so I got to see that firsthand. On top of that, I grew up in Silicon Valley, so I was in, in over 500 interviews, whether someone was interviewing me or, or the reverse. So I got to see a lot of in-field experience, and so I hope that there's something today that I will give you that you haven't read, say, on a major media, you know, Forbes or whatnot to give you that insight to make that really cohesive culture in your workplace. Now, who are millennials and what do they really mean to us? Well, the term millennial was actually coined by someone just like you and me, two individuals, William Strauss and Louise Howell. And they were two marketers, generation experts, that said, here's a millennial and here's a list of generalizations about this group and they attached it to. Then, the media companies took off with it and create all these polarizing campaigns to sort of split the generations from each other. From there then you find a lot of things that aren't necessarily correct about the millennial workforce. On top of that, there's many definitions when you go out there. So let's bring this in a little bit. Let's make it a little bit more cohesive and concise definition. For this presentation, I like to say that millennials are in their 20s, usually second generation and average to above average income. Because if you start going out on the spectrum, you get a lot more different of results and I would say generalizations. So there's a lot of things to be said about millennials, but the thing is, is that it's the most ethnically diverse generation ever in the United States. So most things that you say about them aren't necessarily correct. <clears throat> there's one thing though that I like to drive home here, and that is the impact of technology. Now in a previous TED talk I did, I was talking about how you expect everything instantaneously with technology. I call this the Amazon Prime effect. You expect your shoes, your pants, your blazer, and you start to expect your career and your relationships to be instantaneous. But it's not instantaneous. A relationship, a career is a process. While having things in your life such as your shoes and whatnot, that's a gratification. And very often those get mixed. So when you have millennials getting to the workplace, there's this adjustment period that happens. And we'll be seeing that later on in this talk. The second part is the actual long-term decisions that people are making. For instance, when you, you're now seeing people who are buying houses older and older, and they are, say, buying houses older and older, and they're getting married older and older, right? But what does that do? Well, the first time in history we're seeing that there's a group of 20-year-olds who have no long-term obligations you start seeing them jump jobs and taking many retirements at 28 years old going to Australia. All these really interesting behaviors, but because it's the first time in history this has happened. Imagine that you couldn't get married or buy a house until you're 33. What would you do? <laughs> Chances are it would be very similar to the millennial mindset. Now, enough about technology and millennials. Let's get to the tactical things. First off, attraction. How do you attract top talent into your company, specifically millennials? It turns out there's two things you need to consider. There's inner influence and outer influence. The inner influence is, do I like this company? Do they seem relatable to me? And this brings me to a trend that's not only happening in recruiting, but also marketing, called the humification of companies. That you're seeing companies trying to like strip down this corporateness and be more relatable to the end user. And you might say, well, why? Why is that happening? Why are companies now dropping back professionalism in exchange for being more relatable? 
Well, that's because you look at the way we consume content. The way we consume content now is a lot more relatable. You and I can make, say, a TV show in a matter of a day, film it, low production, upload it. And that's the vast majority of content is being produced that way. So then if you have a millennial who's used to all this content being very relatable, and then you have this huge, you know, nice, I'm a professional, I'm in a corporate, you know, and all this stuff, it's not gonna resonate. And they're not gonna be able to build rapport and trust, right? Believe in who they are. So when you're looking at then, when you're recruiting someone, you're trying to target those millennials. I would look at, say, a recruiting video. I would go with lower production. Really drives home, really resonates. On top of that, social media, act as an individual, not as a brand. If someone says something criticizing, well, how would an individual respond to that? There's many things online about companies responding in funny, personal ways, and millennials are able to relate better because it's real, it's the realness. And last but not least, the on-site experience. Many times, because through all my interviews I've been through, yeah, so many companies are like, we need to be professional, and you need to sit here in this room, and you need to sweat for eight hours, and you need to put on deodorant and be you know, really intense. But what if you actually realize this, and you said, okay, put something out in the front of the company and make it an enjoyable experience? How would that go for with a millennial? Probably a lot better. And it's all in the theme of being more relatable. Now, that's the inner influence. What about the outer influence? What do my peers think about the company that I'm looking at? This brings me back to my college days when there was a company called Box. Does anyone here know Box? Box, yeah? One or two, that's the point. Box was a very well, un unknown company at the time, not even an IPO tech company. And they were going up against Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook to compete for the top talent at our university. And so they did something very clever to switch it around. What they did was is they hosted hackathons, had the smartest people go to the hackathons and compete there, and then they would wear the swag, the t-shirts, the cups, and all the bottles, go back to school, and then the other students would see, hey, that person's really smart, and they're wearing box stuff. Why do they like box stuff? And all the smart kids would start wearing it. And it started creating this association between these smart kids like this company. And slowly but surely, all the Rooms were filled with these box t-shirts and people started wanting to work for box even though they didn't know what box did. <laughs> it was, no, it was really bizarre and so it was a magical effect that they put in there and they were able to recruit the top talent even though they weren't in San Francisco. Beyond location, beyond brand, they broke through. So that's going between the peers, how to change what peers think. Next I want to talk about management. Now that we have your top talent individual in the workplace, how do you manage them effectively. Well, there's two things that I hear a lot from employers when I talk to them. They are say either they're unmotivated or they're impatient. Now, if you dive deeper on this, you might see they're actually correlated. You see, just like any other generation, we're sold on going to high school, then to college, and once we go to college, that's like our dream job's right around the corner, right? But it becomes a lot more of an expected reality versus perceived reality. Why? Because all the filtered reality through Instagram through social media of how everyone's life is somehow perfect, and you're expecting it's gonna be perfect there too. And I was talking to the CIO of Box a year ago in uh, Canada, and he was telling me, you know, three months in when we hire people, they drop an engagement right out of college. Don't know why, but I knew why. Because you have that huge gap there, and that huge self-image adjustment takes place because they realize that it's not what they thought it was. So these two ways are impatient. Now, how do you bridge that gap? Well, there's actually a very, very, very cool thing about this, is that when someone's more impatient, that means they wanna grow in their career more, right? So as a manager, what you can do then is quantifying the journey. If someone wants to be a senior insert job title, what do you do? Well, instead of saying it's gonna take three years, say here are the practical things you can do to get to this next step. Quantifiable steps. Once they obtain that, boom, they're promoted. Why would you want to do that? Because it makes people feel in control of their destiny. Feel in the control. And if they're impatient, chances are they'll try and want to go through that journey very fast. And now you have a very, very engaged employee. Now, you know I like Gallup Research, and Gallup Research also says that 72% of millennials are more engaged when milestones are qualified. This is management 101. This is very old management, but more than ever, we have to do this because people are impatient and they're expecting constant feedback. So that's the management portion, not retention. You have them there, you're managing, they're starting to be more engaged, but how do you keep them there for as long of a time where they're providing value and 
they're finding value in the workplace. Well, this brings me down to a interesting concept that Harvard Business Review found out, which was millennials value growth more than anything else. What's the best way to promote growth in the workplace? Mentorship. Now, a lot of employers would see that and be like, well, that's fantastic, that's great for the millennial, but what about the more senior person? Well, there's two ways that can help. One, the senior person gets to have that, I'm doing a good thing, I'm adding value to the world. But there's a lot of other questions that more senior people have in terms of questions. For instance, why is there so much turnover in the bottom portion of our company? Or we're making a, an event just like this. How do we engage millennials? Or how do we make marketing materials that really resonate with millennials? There's a lot of questions that can't be answered in a room full of executives that you need to harbor that other generation knowledge. This is called reverse mentoring. I first came across it before I was in research. It was actually, I was in a, uh, my first corporate job. And being a really naive millennial, I saw the CTO of the company and I was thinking, I want to be there in three years. Like, totally insane. <laughs> he, and it's a billion dollar company too, so it's going to take me a long time to get there. But I said, I want to know what's going on in his life. So I emailed him and I said, hey, can you meet up for 15 minutes? He said, sure. I was like, whoa, oh my gosh, I got to the CTO. And so we met and we had a great conversation and he said, let's meet in two months. I said, sure. Two months later, we sit down, great meeting again. He's like, let's meet again. Sure. So in the third meeting, we start getting more personal. And he starts talking about his kid not falling asleep and he has to drive him around the car to make her fall asleep. On top of that, he's working 16 hour days. Now I read a lot and there's a good time management book called Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy that I thought was amazing. And I said, hey, I have the MP3 of that. Do you want to listen to that while you're driving? That might help. And he's like, uh, sure, email it to me. So I, says, I send it to his personal email and I don't hear anything though. Don't hear anything. But two weeks later, there's this big box on his desk, this big. And it's filled with the hardcover copy of that book. And he's handed all his directs. You gotta read this, you gotta read this. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is corporate American. I just helped out the CTO. This was one of the best moments I ever had. But what's the point? The point is that you can learn from different generation knowledge from each other. It's not just a one-sided relationship, it's mutual. So that is retention. How do you improve the retention in an organization? And I know a lot of these were sort of themed with this concept of being more relatable, being more personable to millennials, but also just in a culture in general. Because what we're finding out is that the more things we add in the workplace, it's not about that. It's about trying to reach out and make someone resonate and feel comfortable with the other person. So I'd like to leave you with one point. It's that people like working for people and companies are filled with people. So the more you make a company feel personable, the more a millennial will like to work for your company. Thank you.